Today we're going to be doing some quantum mechanics, and in particular, we're going to be looking at the infinite square well. So, we might just want to start by reminding ourselves a little bit about quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, systems are defined by a function called the wave function, which is denoted psi of x. So psi of x is just some function associated with a quantum system that is, in general, complex. The actual physical meaning of psi is that it's a function such that it's modulus squared, so we take the mod squared because it's in general complex, gives us the probability of finding a particle between a region x and x plus some infinitesimal amount dx. So if we wanted the probability that a particle was say between x1 and x2, we would integrate from x1 to x2 of mod psi squared dx. So mod psi squared is really just a probability density function. Because mod psi squared is a probability density function, and our particle must appear somewhere, we know that if we integrate over all space, so from minus infinity to infinity, of mod psi squared, that must be equal to 1. So this is just saying that the total probability that we find the particle somewhere is equal to 1. And this is what we call a normalization condition. So in practice, we'd like to actually be able to find psi for some given system. So this is actually governed by the time-independent Schrodinger equation, or the TISE, as it's commonly called. And this is minus h bar squared over 2m d2 psi by dx squared plus the potential energy of the system times psi is equal to the total energy of the system times psi. So this is a differential equation that governs psi. We might want to define some of the terms. So h bar here is just the reduced Planck constant, h over 2 pi. m is the mass of the particle. V is the potential energy function, and E is the energy of the system. So we can't just solve this equation for any given potential. We need to actually specify a particular potential. So the one we're looking at today is for the infinite square well. And this is a potential that looks like this. It's equal to zero when x is in the range zero and a, and it's infinite otherwise. So let's actually sketch this potential. So if we have our x-axis here, we can label on x equals 0 and x equals a. a is just some constant. And we know that when x is between the range 0 and a, our potential is equal to 0. But it shoots up to infinity outside of this region. So what's the actual physical meaning of this? Well, a particle of finite energy obviously can't exist in a region of infinite potential. So these two regions here are basically forbidden. The particle can't exist there, but it's perfectly happy to be in the region in between. So it's confined to this region between 0 and a. So because the particle can't exist outside of this region, it means that the wave function must be equal to 0 outside this region. But inside, it's just some finite function. So given that we now know that our particle is confined to some region between 0 and a, we'd like to actually be able to solve the Schrodinger equation for this region. So we know that v is equal to 0, so we can simplify our equation. Minus h bar squared over 2m times d2 psi by dx squared, and there can be no potential term because it's equal to 0, is equal to the energy of the system times psi. So we could rearrange this to a slightly better form. d2 psi by dx squared is equal to minus 2me over h bar squared times psi. To make this simpler, we could also go ahead and define k squared as being equal to 2me over h bar squared. And then we could write d2 psi by dx squared equals minus k squared psi. So this is a very famous form of equation in physics, and you might recognise it from classical mechanics. So we could solve this differential equation analytically, but instead we're going to guess solutions, and that's a perfectly valid method of solving a differential equation. We know that when we differentiate this function twice, we need to get out a factor of k squared and also a factor of minus 1. A suitable function might be something like a sine function. So we could say psi of x is equal to sine, say, kx. So when we differentiate this, we'll pull out a factor of k. And when we also differentiate again, we'll pull out a factor of minus 1. Given this trial solution, we could say d psi by dx will be equal to k cos of kx and then d2 psi by dx squared, we'll get another factor of k out, so we'll have a k squared 
but also a factor of minus 1 from differentiating cos sine of kx, which, if you look carefully, is just minus k squared times psi. So this definitely satisfies a differential equation. But this is a second order differential equation. So in general, we're going to need two solutions. So because sine was a solution, it might also be prompted to try cos. So we could say psi of x is cos of kx. And this would give us d psi by dx is equal to minus k sine of kx. And then we could go ahead and do the second derivative. d2 psi by dx squared is minus k squared sine of, sorry, cos of kx. In fact, I'll rub that out, make it a bit neater. We'll get minus k squared cos of kx. So this again is just minus k squared times psi of x. So this also satisfies our differential equation. So we now have two solutions. In order to form a general solution, we'll take a linear combination of the two. So by that, I mean that our general solution is psi of x is some arbitrary constant a times our first solution, sine of kx, plus some other arbitrary constant b times our second solution, solution cos of kx. So now that we've actually got a general form of our wave function, we're going to want to find a particular solution, one that corresponds to the actual physical case we're looking at. But in order to do that, we're going to obviously need boundary conditions to get rid of these arbitrary constants a and b. So if we go back to looking at our potential again, we know that psi is equal to zero in the regions that are outside of zero a. And we require that psi of x is some nice smooth continuous function. So because psi is equal to zero outside the region, it must be equal to zero right at the boundaries. So we can use these to get the arbitrary constants. We've now got two boundary conditions. Our first boundary condition is that psi is equal to 0 at 0, so x equals 0, and otherwise we could just say psi of 0 equals 0. So let's actually plug this in and see what we get. So psi of 0 will be a sine of 0 plus b cos of 0. Sine of 0 is just 0, and cos of 0 is 1, so we just get b. But we know that must be equal to 0. So b equals 0 for all x. So we can now write psi of x it's just equal to a sine of kx. So that's good, we've gotten rid of the cos term. We now I want to impose our second boundary condition. So our second boundary condition is that psi is equal to zero at the other end of the potential well. So psi of a equals zero. Let's give ourselves a bit more space here. So psi of a is equal to a sine of ka. And this must be equal to zero. So we have to do a bit of thinking here. We could have that a is equal to 0, since we've got a product that's equal to 0 here. But if a was equal to 0, then we'd have psi is equal to 0 for all x. And this is a very unsatisfactory solution. We're actually looking for solutions that correspond to a physical particle being somewhere. But if psi is equal to 0 everywhere, then we've got no particle. So we can't have that a is equal to 0. So instead, we must have that sine of ka is equal to 0. Now, we know from the properties of the sine function that if sine of x is equal to 0, then x must be equal to some integer multiple pi. You can see that just by looking at a quick sketch of the sine function. So if that was pi there, 2 pi, we can see this function carries on like that. So if sine x equals 0, x is equal to m pi for some n equals 0, 1, 2. And also negative numbers, but we're not really concerned with those. So if sine of ka is equal to 0, so we must have that ka is equal to some integer multiple of pi. So again, we could then write k is equal to m pi over a. So our boundary condition actually hasn't really told us anything about big A, but it has told us that k is quantized. It can only come in discrete integer multiples of pi over a. So you might write kn is equal to n pi over a. So there are infinitely many values that k can take. Because k is written explicitly in terms of e, the energy itself is also quantized. So we might just go back up here and get some more space. So we know that k squared is equal to 2me over h bar squared. And we now have that kn equals n pi over a. And there are infinitely many values that k can take. We could then write the 2me over h bar squared. And it's now going to be the energy that's quantized because that's the variable here, is equal to n squared pi squared over a squared. 
just squaring this expression we have here. So we could then rearrange for the energy. En equals n squared pi squared h bar squared over 2ma squared. So we've now found that there are actually infinitely many solutions to this equation. One for each n. So we'll have wave functions psi n of x equal to a sine, and we did have kx, but we're now going to have n pi over ax. So each of these wave functions is a different state that our particle can be in in the potential well, each with a well-defined energy given by en here. But we might also note that we can't have the n equals zero case, because that would give us that psi is equal to zero everywhere, and there'd be no particle. So we're only really interested in n is greater than or equal to one. We could also go ahead and simplify our expression for the energy. We know that h bar is equal to h over 2 pi, where h is Planck's constant. So we can actually write that en is equal to n squared h squared over 8 ma squared. Just gets rid of that factor of pi and adds in a factor of 4 on the bottom. So let's actually go ahead and draw some of these wave functions and look at what these states are like. So you might draw a slightly bigger potential well here. Change colour as well. So this is our potential well. 0 and a. So let's look at the n equals 1 state. Let's just quickly write down our general wave function again. Psi n is a sine of n pi over a x. So for our first wave function, the n equals 1 case, we're just going to get sine of pi over a times x. So this is going to be a wave function that looks like this. This is essentially the largest wavelength wave function that we can fit in our potential well. And this is the n equals 1 state. And we know that the energy increases of n. So this is the lowest energy state. And it's got an energy E1 equal to h squared over 8m a squared. And in quantum mechanics, we call the lowest energy state the ground state. Higher energy states are called excited states. So if we look at the second state, we'll actually get something like this. And this will have a slightly higher energy, E2 equal to 4 h squared over 8 m a squared, because the energy scales with n squared, not just n. So this is the second excited state, the n equals 2, 1. So from the boundary conditions, we've managed to show that there are only certain states that are allowed in the potential world. And the most important thing about them is that they come in discrete quantized energies, E n equals n squared h squared over 8 m a squared. So the energies are quantized into discrete packets. But we haven't actually come any closer to finding A. So to do that, we're going to have to look at the normalization condition. So you remember that the total probability of finding a particle in our well must be equal to 1. It must be somewhere. So in other words, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of mod psi squared dx is equal to 1. But of course, our wave function only exists in the region between 0 and A. So we're not actually integrating from minus infinity to infinity in this case. We'd integrate between 0 and a. So if we write down our wave function again, psi n of x is equal to a sine of m pi over ax. Now in general, our wave function could be complex, but we have a real part here and a constant a. So in general, a could be complex. So when we take the mod of psi squared, we're not just going to write a squared, we're going to write mod a squared. So mod psi n squared will be mod a squared. And then this part's real, so we can just write sine squared of m pi over a x. And we know that the integral of this from 0 to a should be equal to 1. So let's go ahead and do that integration. So a is a constant, so we can put it outside of the integral. So we'll write mod a squared integral from 0 to a with sine squared of n pi over a x dx is equal to 1. So this is actually a pretty simple integral, and to do it, we're going to use a trig identity. Sine squared x is 1 half times 1 minus cos of 2x. So if we go ahead and substitute that in, we'll get 1 half outside, mod a squared, integral from 0 to a, and we'll now have 1 minus cos of 2n pi over ax. So here we're treating n pi over ax as the x in this equation. dx is equal to 1. So let's give ourselves a little bit more space. So we can now go ahead and integrate this. 1 half mod a squared, and we'll get an x and a minus a over 2n pi 
sine of 2n pi over a times x between 0 and a is equal to 1. So starting with the upper limit, we'll get 1 half mod a squared, and we'll just get an a here, minus a over 2m pi sine, and we'll have a 2m pi over a times a, so that'll just be 2m pi. And then the lower limit's trivial, it's just 0 for both of them, sine of 0 is 0. And that's equal to 1. But we know that sine of 2m pi is equal to 0. So this actually simplifies down to a half mod a squared times little a is equal to 1. And then we can write mod a squared equals 2 over a. So we only require that mod a squared is equal to 2 over a. So in general, there's a whole ring of complex numbers that will satisfy this, something like that. But we may as well just choose a trivial case where a is real. We don't lose any information in doing this because the mod of a squared will still be equal to 2 over a. And that's our only requirement. So we could write a squared equals 2 over a. So a is the positive root of 2 over a. We're just going to choose the positive one. It doesn't actually really make a difference whether we choose a negative one or not. Now that we have that a is equal to the square root of 2 over a, we can go ahead and write our general wave function. So let's give ourselves a bit more space. So we did have that psi n of x is equal to a sine of m pi over a times x. So we can now go ahead and write psi n of x is equal to the square root of 2 over a times sine of m pi over a x. We've now actually solved this equation and got a normalized wave function out. So we've now pretty much solved this problem. We know what each wave function will look like for each state and we know what the energies of the states are. And I'll write this down again. En is equal to n squared h squared over 8 m a squared. But because we're doing physics here, we might actually want to get an idea of what kind of energies we could expect. So Say, for example, we had an electron in an infinite square well. So the infinite square well turns out to be quite a good approximation for some physical systems, uh, usually things like nuclei and some kind of semiconductor problems. So let's say our potential well has a width of, say, uh, 10 to the minus 10 meters, so one angstrom. That's a typical kind of sort of nuclear scale. So we have an electron in here. So obviously the mass is going to be the mass of an electron, 9.11 times 10, oh, that's not right, is it? That's 9.111. Uh, so 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. So we might want to actually have a look at what some of these energies look like. So say the ground state energy, E1, is just equal to H squared over 8MA squared. And if we go ahead and plug in these values into our calculator, we should get E1 is about 6.03 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. But joules isn't a really convenient energy scale for particle physics. Uh, we tend to use electron volts. So one electron volt is the energy required to accelerate an electron across a potential difference of one volt. So basically we just take our energy and divide it by the charge of an electron. So this turns out to be about 37.7 electron volts. So this tells us that our theoretical treatment is probably right. Because this is the kind of energy that we actually typically observe in sort of solid state physics experiments. So this is about the right energy scale. You might also want to have a look at the second energy. So E2 equal to 4 h squared over 8 m a squared. And this turns out to be about 150.8 electron volts. So it's quite a bit higher and it's important to note that the energies aren't evenly spaced. We know that energy goes up as n squared. So if we were to look at the delta E, so the energy difference between, say, the nth plus 1th state and the nth state. This would be equal to h squared over 8 m a squared times m plus 1 squared minus n squared. So we can simplify that and get rid of the n squared term. So that would be an h squared over 8 m a squared times 2n plus 1. So we can see that the energy difference goes up with n. So they're not evenly spaced. So this kind of finishes our first discussion of the infinite square well, but there's really a lot more to talk about here. It forms the basis of a lot of problems in quantum mechanics, and we haven't yet looked at any of the expectation values, which give us a better idea of the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics.